In this presentation, we will look at the social and cultural background of the Renaissance, the idea of humanism, and Florence, and the Medici family, which is where the Renaissance really is, um, where it really started. We'll also, uh, towards the end, summarize some of the characteristics of Renaissance visual art. The word Renaissance literally means rebirth, and although we use it to designate a time period, which is approximately 1400 to 1600, it's important to remember that it was also an idea or a philosophy. It was a choice on the part of the leaders of the Renaissance to embrace the beauty and the ideals of Greek and Roman culture. Remember that the Parthenon had been standing all through the Middle Ages. The Greek and Roman statuary was very well visible during all of the Middle Ages, but its beauty was ignored by those people. They were concerned with the afterlife, not the affairs of this life. They were mystical and ascetic and felt that much of that was a representation of a pagan world that they rejected. So the Renaissance is a conscious choice not just to discover Greek culture, but to embrace it and to emulate it. Capitalism was a major force at this time. In the medieval feudal system, wealth had been based entirely on land and inheritance. In the Renaissance, we see that people can earn money based on their contribution to society. People could become wealthy, and as that became possible, it also became a goal for many people. This is part of why many times people think that the Renaissance is really the beginning of the modern world, because that idea of concentrating on this life, this world, and seeking material wealth is, is rooted in this time period. Another important element to consider in this shift in wealth is that patronage of the arts by wealthy people became important. In the Renaissance and actually beyond, the church will remain the single largest patron. Um, if you took Europe as a whole, the church would be the single largest patron. However, their wealthy families and even just the middle class people could seek out portraits or artwork on their own. The Renaissance was also an age of discovery. Marco Polo in the previous century had opened up trade with the East, the, along with trade ideas such as gunpowder, postal systems, um, and various other technologies found their way to Europe. Christopher Columbus, of course, was headed to America. And in general, there was a curiosity and an ambition to discover more. The printing press was invented in around 1445, which was important. Um, it helped to create a wider literate reading public, so information could be spread quickly and accurately. It's important to remember it's not just how information was spread, but what kinds of information were spread. So, scientific, information could be shared. And although we know that the first item printed using the movable print type was the Gutenberg Bible, it actually became very crucial to the Reformation. So these are some books by Martin Luther and John Calvin which were printed and distributed and contributed greatly to the religious upheaval of the 15th century and 16th century. This upheaval is important not just because the nature of the church or theology was changing, but because there was no longer this sense of absolute authority emanating from a single source, the Roman Catholic Church. The church was divided and people began to think more individualistically. So there were choices to be made and People needed to trust their own judgment to some extent. We're going to look at humanism. This is the really important philosophical background to the Renaissance, both culturally and politically and artistically. 
it was um, focused on human, human humanity's potential for achievement, whereas the medieval and Gothic periods had been focused on the afterlife and the original sin that made man flawed and need to seek redemption. Humanism is much more about doing what we can in this life. It was a new worldview, and it certainly affected all of intellectual life, but it, it was not a rejection of Christianity. In fact, Christianity and Greek thinking were put together. Um, there is sort of combined in something called Neoplatonism, and that was a big goal of Pope Justin II to combine the two ways of thinking. One aspect of humanism was the rediscovery of classical antiquity. All you had to do was look around to see the work that was already there, and this rediscovery was maybe, maybe I should say, a re-embracing or um, a reconnecting with those works. Classical mythology became a popular subject for poetry and visual art. You'll see that nudes reappear in art. There was all figures were draped and clothed in the medieval time, but now we have the gods and goddesses reappearing in visual art. And it, it was conflated with Christianity. We'll see that in the Botticelli painting we'll look at soon. Another feature was the focus on humankind. So that idea of thinking as an individual, personal autonomy and intelligence became very important. This is a painting of Florence from around 1490. And we'll look at Florence for a minute because it was the cradle of the Renaissance. We could think of Florence as the cradle and Francesco, Francesco Petrarch as the father of the Renaissance. So he went around Europe doing research, rediscovering the texts by ancient Greek and Roman authors, and he praised a time when poets were held in highest honor and sought to recreate that in his own time. Florence was the banking and financial center of Europe and also had a democracy, both of which helped to feed the rebirth of the arts. There were many families providing patronage so that the secular art, the art of the portrait, which had largely, largely fallen out of favor in the medieval times, the portrait was coming back in a big way as people were able to afford to commission them. The single largest banking family was the Medici family, they ran the largest bank in Europe, and the reason we can say they were the true rulers of Florence by the late 15th century is that everyone needed help from the Medicis. So the church had religious authority and the state had political authority, but everyone needed to borrow money. Lorenzo de' Medici was called Il Magnifico. He was not only a wealthy and skilled politician, but also a patron and collector of the arts, and an artist himself. Central to the city of Florence is its cathedral. So this is the first great Renaissance church. Brunelleschi won a competition to design a dome for this church. The church was already standing, but he had to be very ingenious because he needed to create a dome that could span the 140 foot wide barrel that had already been constructed. So usually a dome is built around an arch and wooden centering holds it up until a keystone comes in. But this this couldn't be done. The, the technology that had been used to build the Pantheon had been lost. So he needed to make the dome lighter. And the way he did this was by making it a double dome. So instead of being completely solid all the way through, there's an interior and exterior. 
There's actually enough room that if you visit this cathedral, you can walk up into the dome and walk between the interior and the exterior. Another way in which he had to be, or was, ingenious was in hoisting materials up high enough to be used in the dome. So he created a, a hoist where instead of, it was reversible. So instead of having to re-harness the animals that were going around in circles to make this rise up, the mechanism itself could be re reversed so that the animals could remain harnessed and work went much more efficiently. There are numerous ingenious ideas that Brunelleschi used to create this. Here's a picture from the outside of the dome and another showing the some of the classical style of the exterior and here we have a photograph of the interior of the dome. I'll just summarize some elements of Renaissance visual art to help focus your study and sort of pull together the things that you're reading in the book. One aspect is idealized human form. We can see how clearly this Michael, a David by Michelangelo relates to the idealized forms of Greek sculpture. It was also individual, so there was um, some idealization and also individual qualities in each sculpture. Perhaps in two-dimensional art, perhaps the most important development in the Renaissance is the idea of perspective and chiaroscuro. Perspective is the ability to create a realistic feeling of depth or space in a painting. And chiaroscuro is the use of light and dark or shadow to create uh, depth in the figure. So for instance, um, shadowing underneath someone's eye or eyelid to make the eye appear realistic. Um, you will want to remember the name of Masakio who painted this Holy Trinity. This particular fresco is painted on a wall and it is famous as one of the first examples of someone successfully using linear perspective. So you can see the way those lines converge on a vanishing point that creates the illusion of depth, and Masaccio is famous for this. Another feature is the highly organized closed compositions. So you can see here this central trio of figures, and your eye is not led outside the canvas at all. It's contained, it's organized. You can also see other things here. If you look at the background, you can see there are no yellow, blue, uh, sorry, yellow, orange, or red type shades. The warmth of the colors in the very, very background is gone. There's only bluish colors, hazy colors. That's called atmospheric perspective. And even though this painting doesn't use any particular linear perspective, atmospheric perspective is used to give a convincing sense of depth. So you can see the focus on the central trio, and then the nude figures in the middle ground are less focused, and then the mountains and the sky in the distance are even more hazy. That's another element where if you looked at this and someone said to you, is this a medieval painting of the Holy Family or a Renaissance painting of the Holy Family? You would know it's Renaissance because it features the nude figures in the mid-ground, which was not part of medieval art. A mixture of classical and Christian subjects is shown in this painting. This is called La Primavera, which is Italian for spring. If we go from right to left, we can see the bluish figure on the right. That's Zephyr, and he's blowing the warm west wind onto Chloris, who is the goddess of the earth. And out of Chloris's mouth, you can see a vine emerging as she comes to life with the warm spring weather. She's right next to Flora, who is the goddess of flowers, and you can see the beautiful flowers scattered all over her figure and dress. In the middle, we have the goddess Venus, the goddess of love, and next to her, the three graces, who are chastity, beauty, and passion, dancing a springtime dance. Next to them is Mer Mercury with his winged boots. He's about to leave and announce that spring has sprung. So this is classical mythology. However, if you look at this central figure, you see there's a little cherub above her, 
and she has a halo. The halo is created by the opening in the trees behind her. This looks very much like the Virgin Mary. So here you have that idea of conflating the Christian and the Greek at the same time. This subject matter is more purely classical. This is Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And you can see Venus just born on the shell. And next to her is her handmaid with a robe waiting to cover up her shy body. She's, she's demure, but she was just born, so she's in her natural element. Um, but it's just such a charming painting with the flowers floating gently down from the sky. There's no use of, not no, but there's very little use of perspective in this painting. But we know it's Renaissance because of the subject matter, because it's classical mythology. And a female nude is something that would not have appeared in medieval work. Another element would be the fascination with visual illusions. So this slide, it looks like you're looking at a chapel that is built off to the side of a larger room. However, it's a flat wall. And this is just a trompe l'oeil or a trick of the eye painting using their newfound fascination with perspective. Another way in which that was popular was uh, something called intarsia, where they would take small pieces of wood veneer and make these elaborate rooms. So this is an entire room covered in small pieces of veneer. And that wall where you think you see a door recessed is actually a flat wall, and the illusion is created from the intarsia. Um, this slide, you can skip. This is meant to be in a different presentation. Uh, and here I just have some quick slides to help you summarize visually in your mind what we've studied so far. So if you look at the left, you see a very rigid Greek chorus from the Archaic period. But then the next two figures show the more classical style, the S-curve, the contraposto, and a much more realistic portrayal. Then we move forward and we see in the Romanesque time, there's no real effort being made to portray a natural figure. The drapery is rigid, the anatomy is unrealistic, the figures are elongated, showing a Byzantine influence. There's no expression of individuality or personal expression. Then in the Gothic era, we see it's not entirely natural, but the drapery looks more realistic. The characters' faces are tilted and there are hand gestures and facial expressions that are far more individualistic, even though it's still somewhat stylized and the figures are somewhat elongated. Now we look at Michelangelo's David and we can clearly see the return to the Greek ideal. So the next few slides are unlabeled and they're just a challenge to you to see using what you've read so far and seen so far in the class, can you tell what period this is from? Is it medieval? Is it Romanesque, Gothic? Those are both, you can call both of those medieval, but is it Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, or Greek? And then the same question here, is this Greek, Romanesque, Gothic, or Renaissance? And one more example with the same question. So hopefully you feel like you can figure out the answers to that.